Good evening, everybody. Nice to see you today. Uh, my name is Mike Scott. I'm the Program and Community Partnership Director at Farm Table Foundation. But our, our mission is to build local food culture. And we do that through education and research and training. And have about last year we had about 70 programs, most of them online. Um, and then we've got a, a local foods restaurant, an organic restaurant. And we seek to really rekindle our connections between people and local food, farmers, and the land. And so Ellie is the uh, interim farm manager on Lily Springs Farm, and she's the lead educator there as well. She also works part-time on another farm and uh, has been in the area for about three years on the farm. And Ellie, feel free to say more about yourself and Lily Springs as you get going. So welcome, everybody. Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, and thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, so my name is Ellie Sullivan. I use she, her pronouns. And um, like Mike said, I work at, work and teach at Lily Springs Farm. Um, that's in Osceola, Wisconsin. So we're maybe 15 minutes away from farm table um, and about an hour to east of the cities. And it, it is, eventually I'll, I'll love to hear kind of where you all are living and growing and gardening. Um, and try to tune some of my um, recommendations based on that. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Lily Springs, we're a, a hundred acre regenerative farm, primarily focused on demonstration and education, um, but we also do produce some, uh, some crops for market, including blackcurrant, raspberries, elderberry, aronia, a variety of medicinal and culinary herbs, as well as hemp for CBD. Um, and then we do a fair amount of um, agritourism and, and education. Uh, and then we're also working with a team of uh, meat goats to graze our, um, our sort of inherited red, red pine timber plantation um, in an effort to transition that to our native oak woodland ecology, uh, which will provide us further um, agricultural and uh, education opportunities as well. So um, before I get started with, uh, with our garden um, talk, I want to acknowledge that Lily Springs is on Anishinaabe, Ho-Chunk, and Dakota ancestral lands. Um, and actually a lot of the key plants that we will be talking about tonight, um, as well as the knowledge about their uses and their benefits come from um, indigenous practices, indigenous knowledge. There is a growing awareness of how important um, perennial and especially native perennial plants are to our food systems and our medicine systems um, and our, our general ecosystems, which is wonderful, all for that. Um, but it, it is important to remember that uh, in the history of the US, indigenous communities have often been um, actively persecuted for, for practicing those traditional um, food and medicine systems. Um, and then systematically sort of left out of the boom that's currently occurring um, in the agricultural and, and herbalism industries. Um, so whenever possible, I ask you to buy seeds from native owned seed companies, um, frequent native owned nurseries, take classes from local indigenous teachers, support local native led and focused um, knowledge recovery efforts uh, and programs. There are a lot of resources for finding out whose ancestral lands you live on um, and then connecting with those local indigenous groups. Um, and I will have resources at the end of this presentation as well on some recommendations for places around uh, Polk County and, um, and the Twin Cities area. We all benefit from the revitalization of resilient indigenous practices. And so I think we should all actively contribute um, to that as well. So I will share my screen now. Um, like Mike said, there are gonna be a couple points where I um, sort of prompt you all to, to answer in circle. Mike, while I'm sharing my screen, if you could maybe help sort of monitor like who's unmuting and, and um, direct that. 
uh, that'd be great. And then, um, and then again, at the end of the presentation, we'll have a chance to sort of do a group think on um, both questions. And then if we wanna do some out loud garden planning, designing all of that, um, there'll, be, there'll be time for that. Yeah, great, Ellie. I could even um, call on people and, you know, you could either say pass or, and then talk, and then you could put your, put yourself back on mute after you've talked so it doesn't interrupt other people or, uh, so we could actually do it that way if you like, Ellie, I'll call on folks. Yeah, that, that'd be great. Okay. Oops, there we go. All right. So to start, um, I want to set some guidelines I'm not focusing on. One is foraging. Um, although a lot of the plants that we talk about tonight um, are things that you can forage locally as well. Uh, I won't be talking a ton about fruit trees, orchard trees. I'll mention them in passing, like these plants work well in fruit tree guilds. Um, but I don't consider myself an orchardist, um, and I uh, have um, I have some experiential knowledge based on what we grow at Lily Springs, so we can certainly talk about that in the discussion portion if folks are looking for recommendations. Um, but I won't be going too much into those larger um, fruit tree crops. And then finally, um, I want to remind everyone that. The practices and the plants that we're talking about, um, you know, Lily Springs is, is a hundred acre farm. You can do this in the, you can have a thriving perennial garden in the space of a typical annual raised bed garden. Um, and you can expand it to far beyond a hundred acres. Um, the, the opportunities are really endless and I don't want anyone to feel like they don't have enough room um, or they don't have a big enough property to implement a lot of these practices and growing methods because um, it's just not true. I mean, we can have uh, really thriving, productive perennial gardens um, in very, very small spaces. And then to give you all sort of a roadmap for my presentation, um, We'll start with just a little bit of um, this foundation laying of native ecosystems and some of the agroforestry and regenerative ag practices that we use at Lily Springs um, and how that can inform perennial garden design. And then we'll have sort of a broad review of the different garden planning parameters and lenses through which you can approach that. Uh, narrowing in on some specific plant recommendations um, and design considerations to keep in mind. I'll briefly touch on some caretaking generalities. Um, again, feel free to ask more specific questions. Um, and then we'll have a little closing and end with discussion. So, um, oh, I got ahead of myself. Native ecosystems of Minnesota and Wisconsin. Um, Three key ones that guide um, my approach to perennial gardens, um, oak savannas, riparian woodlands, and tall grass prairies. Oak savannas are characterized by this about 50-50 um, ratio between sun and shade. Um, savannas are incredibly productive ecosystems, um, also extremely uh, ecologically stable, um, climate resilient. Uh, a lot of the nutrition in those ecosystems comes from the decaying um, woody matter from especially hardwood trees, and then um, which is then broken down um, in part by the mycelial, the fungal networks. Um, and that I will touch back on later when we're talking about caretaking of perennial gardens. Um, tall grass prairies, deep-rooted perennials with full sun. Um, that informs a lot of the pollinator plants that we, um, that we wanna see out here. And then finally, riparian woodlands. These are ecosystems characterized by um, sort of seasonal water changes. 
uh, and plants that can tolerate or even prefer having wet feet, um, which is not the case with all perennials. Um, and so there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of diversity and richness in those woodland edges that are getting partial to full sun um, and, and have a lot of uh, water availability to them. Depending on where you live, um, you, can, you can dive deeper into um, more, specific, uh, more specific breakdowns of these ecosystems. Um, you can uh, look up sort of key, um, you know, keystone plants in each of those, um, and that can help further guide more specific garden planning as well. So regenerative agriculture and agroforestry, um, these are some buzzwords that you may or may not be familiar with, um, but basically this is just a paradigm in which we are combining agriculture with the teachings of um, forests and woodlands um, and generally perennial, uh, perennial ecosystems. One, um, one big aspect of this is, um, is, ag is food forest design. So uh, mimicking our agricultural plantings off of the many layers of a healthy forest. Um, and Healthy woodlands are really stable. They're self-sustaining for the most part. Mimicking that in our garden and agricultural designs helps us build an ecosystem that requires fewer inputs. It's more um, resilient to a variety of pressures um, and is still really productive for um, you know, food, medicine, pollinator uh, habitat. Another aspect of regenerative agriculture is this focus on perennials. Um, look around you, what plants already grow in your neighborhood, in your local parks, um, go to local um, land conservation projects. This can help guide our thinking on what to add to our garden. If you see it growing in your ditch with uh, no care whatsoever, it's probably going to want to grow in your garden if you're tending it um, and watering it. Either way, um, you can, you know, you can plant native varieties, um, or in some cases, it's appropriate to plant a non-native cultivar of a species. Uh, for example, at Lily Springs, our currants um, are actually a Russian cultivar from a very similar latitude uh, to, to Polk County. Um, but by planting Russian currants, we can avoid some of the pest and disease pressures that native currants sometimes face. Regenerative agriculture is typically really ecologically resilient. Um, I'm assuming that if you're part of this conversation, you um, have some critiques of our uh, monoculture industrial ag um, system. And, uh, and really regenerative agriculture, perennial based agriculture can address a lot of those issues. Um, Disease, pests, other pressures are always going to be present in an, in an uh, ecosystem. But if you design a forest or savanna inspired garden, especially if you use native plants, you're creating a habitat that's gonna actually attract and support your native insects, birds, amphibians, small mammals. Um, and all of these uh, players are going to help increase the stability and the resiliency of your garden. There is some understanding of the beneficial relationships between flora and fauna, um, but it's, it's sort of a sum is greater than the whole of its parts idea. Um, there's no way that we can map truly all of the complex interactions in these diverse ecologically stable environments and so by inviting that diversity and inviting um, that native resiliency, you are going to um, foster stronger, uh, healthier plants, um, especially if they're native plants that in all likelihood depend on um, thrive with those complex interactions. And then finally, um, native perennial gardens tend to be really climate adaptive and climate resilient. Native plants 
are first of all already adapted to our unique soils, water, weather systems. Um, I'm not asking them to be your entire source of food. I still go to the grocery store and buy strawberries out of season sometimes. Um, but they do provide this little extra measure of safety in a changing climate. Um, for example, at Lily Springs, we grow aronia berries, um, a native berry that not many people are familiar with. They're pretty astringent. They're best, I think, um, once you process them into something like a jam or a syrup um, or dry them for preserves. But the aronia berry shrub will hold on to its berries for up to weeks um, and not plump up if you're in a drought. And they're, they tend to be sort of a late, late, summer, um, late summer harvest. So come August, early September, we haven't gotten any rain for a few weeks. Um, all the other berries are looking shriveled and dry and aronia are just waiting for like that one little rainstorm or that one extra dewy morning, they plump right up and they're perfect to harvest. Um, Ecolo or regenerative um, agriculture um, typically uh, typically focuses on you know fewer inputs, um, less maintenance overall, and that's because um, we can get away with that because perennials are um, tend to have deeper roots than than more tender annual veggies. Um, they have um, they have uh, growing cycles that are a little bit more, um, flexible. Uh, they aren't, you know, shortened into, you know, especially up here, a, a four or five month growing season. So I just gave you a ton of information to give you all a minute to kind of process and, um, synthesize. I would love to hear, um, what everyone's specific, uh, garden goals are. Like, why are you interested in this class? What about perennial plants is intriguing to you in a garden context? If we don't want to just go around and share a quick thought from everyone sure. and maybe where, where you are in the world. Ellie, maybe I'll just start. Um, this is Mike, I'm, uh, I'm at farm table and I'll go ahead and call on people. So if you can keep yourself muted in case there's background noise, that would be great. But um, right now I'm seeing Alyssa, you're at the top of my list. So Alyssa, if you have anything to share, if you could unmute yourself. Yeah, hello. Um, uh, I'm happy to be here. My name is Alyssa, I'm in South Minneapolis. And you know, I have goals for my garden here at my house, also really trying to establish more perennials, um, more pollinator plants and um, yeah, less input and more just um, like what, like just like harnessing what these natives really want. And I think um, I've learned over the years of annual vegetables that I'm, I'm not really finding that with, with annual vegetables. So yeah, just here to sort of learn more around the design components. Um, I'm also an educator and a gardener sort of by profession too and sort of beginning to do some workshops and like possibility sessions with some garden clients about how they can reimagine their yards too. So I'm always learning and always growing. Um, but yeah, hoping to kind of get some good nuggets with this workshop and um, I'm also connected with Philadelphia Community Farm, which is out in Osceola as well. And um, it's a biodynamic farm. It's not um, regenerative or using agroforestry, but I'm just kind of curious about ways that we can incorporate some of this there. So happy to be here. Thanks a lot, Alyssa. Um, and uh, Ellie, maybe it's, I have a question. Maybe it'd be a good time to just say it. You know, these four parts of that you've hi highlighted here when regenerative ag is obviously being used a lot and maybe in some cases almost to replace organic ag, right? And, and so, mm -hmm. and I don't think of perennials, at least in a lot of the ways that I hear people talking about regenerative ag, I don't necessarily think perennials, you know, because people are talking about, well, cover cropping and, you know, no-till and that that's part of moving toward regenerative ag at least, but, um, 
I guess I'm wondering about the role of perennials in, not, in, in regenerative ag and particularly in maybe more, if you're a little bit more of a mainstream farmer, so to speak, and how you would describe that. Yeah, that's a great question. And, um, you know, similar debates happening around, uh, you know, organic farming or have happened around organic or sustainable. Maybe I should have titled this slide regenerative with a lowercase r. Um, it's not, uh, yeah, there's not any one way to be a regenerative farmer or gardener. Um, it's certainly a good there are some good tools to help folks transition from more um, industrial conventional agriculture to agroforestry or regenerative ag. Cover crops is certainly a great element. Um, you know, at a very basic level, it's it's honestly just thinking a little bit more holistically about soil health, water health, um, human farmer health, um, not just sort of end all be all. Um, yields and profits. Um, for folks who are in sort of that transition mode, things like cover crops, um, elements of agroforestry like hedgerows or windrows, um, which are essentially just lines of trees or shrubs in between um, larger, more conventional fields, those are often highlighted as um, regenerative ag. And I think it, it goes a lot deeper um, and we can continue to push it um, further and further towards um, towards truly mimicking what we see in, in nature, because uh, I think she figured it out pretty well, um, and we have a lot to learn from that. But yeah, definitely there's, there's it's a spectrum for sure. Thanks, Ellie. Um, okay, Alyssa's gone. Austin, I see you next. If you'd like, if you have something you want to add to Ellie's question. Hey, so I'm in Vadnais Heights, Minnesota kind of north of St. Paul. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, and so I'm pretty kind of new to the whole gardening permaculture thing. So my goals for this year, if I could have a couple of berry plants that I could get out and eat from. Um, Austin, we you're muted again. Oh. Sorry, yeah, I was saying I'd like to get some berries and build some soil long term. But this year, just trying to get some, you know, perennials in the ground. I feel like there's not a ton of um, like cold climate permaculture videos. So. All right, great. Thanks, Austin. Uh, the next name I see up is DMBRE. So I'm not sure who you are, but if you can unmute yourself. It's Diana. Hi, Dan. Uh, yep. I'm uh, just outside of Clear Lake. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to augment my regular gardening and my regular vegetable um, and fruit tree gardening with uh, perennials, um, some other items to, you know, add to the mix that, you know, if some seeds weren't available this year. I still have something else that's that's growing, um, something other than red-rooted pigweed, <laughs> which <laughs> we have an abundance here. Um, that's about it. Thanks, Diane. Uh, Aaron, if you have something you'd like to add. Yeah, I'm just a backyard gardener and um, I'm interested in helping pollinators and just um, I have a couple of beds of annuals, but I'd like to start adding perennials like I was thinking about berry bushes and um, I'm very interested in working with what, what Mother Nature knows to be successful. So that's all I got. Thanks. Uh, how about you, Lori? Um, I am pretty much a novice. So I'm looking at just any kind of information and I do have some limitations on space. So I might be doing even some container gardening or um, like a raised bed. And that's it. All right, thank, thank you, Lori. Uh, we've got one left, Matthew. Yeah, can everybody hear me? Yep, we got you. Okay. 
Hi, um, I'm in I'm in South Minneapolis, and um, I'm a I'm a beginner gardener. I've done a little bit of container gardening, gardening, <laughs> and um, but I uh, also have a small uh, bunkhouse in Amory, uh, and so I've, whenever we're in Amory, I go to farm table uh, uh, almost every time I'm in Amory. So I love it there. But um, we have a some shady land in Amory, and then also a little bit of a clearing. So I'm just kind of open to whatever. Um, would grow in that area a little bit edible and a little bit just fun to have around for the bees and things and maybe some some ways to uh, keep the deer away. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we do have deer so. Great Matthew. Well it's good to meet you over this way. Hopefully you can meet you when you're at farm table someday. Yeah. Um, and I guess I would just mention to you all uh, Farm Table has a Victory Garden initiative going on right now. Uh, last year, when the pandemic hit, we launched it. We had 175 people purchase a tray of, of veggies from Dragonfly Gardens here in Amory. And then every week, we put out a, a weekly video from the garden, you know, maybe just 10, 15 minutes, kind of an instructional video from the garden. And we're doing that again this year. So far, you know, we didn't think we'd get 175, but we already have 67 people signed up for it. So if you're interested in actually purchasing a flat of, of veggies, you can do that. But you can also just sign up to be, you know, to know about the videos, to get an alert about the videos, because every week we'll be doing videos and there's both kind of an intermediate level of video. And then last year's videos are a little more uh, beginner and you, you'll have links to both. If you kind of want some accompaniment in your gardening this year, uh, you might be interested in those videos and the Victory Garden program. I've typed in my my name and address, email address in the chat box if you want to be in touch with me about any of that. So Ellie, feel free to jump in now again and, and respond to folks or whatever you're up to next. Thanks. Awesome. I love hearing about all of your, um, yeah, your garden goals and plans um, and unique uh, challenges to them. Um, I'll try to touch on some of the specific questions um, or thoughts that you all brought up. Um, and again, feel free to, um, to either, I don't know, give a little wave or something that could indicate to Mike that you have a question or, or put something in the chat so you don't lose it. Um, So I'm now going to kind of hone in um, and talk about, um, you know, the, the few different lenses through which we can look at um, what perennials to incorporate into our gardens. A lot of you mentioned food, um, which is awesome. And then um, medicinals and pollinator friendly plants. Um, I'll just give a little spoiler. There's a lot of overlap. Um, and, uh, and so if you're planting something that's good for the bees, it's probably good for you in some way. Um, and, uh, and likewise. So for food focused perennials, um, again, really turning to our local environment. If you have any foraging experience, you probably already have um, some idea of what grows well in this climate. Um, berry bushes are an excellent um, and, and relatively easy way to start incorporating perennials into your, um, your space, especially if you have, um, you know, berry bushes, especially things in the rose family, like our, um, our raspberries and our thimbleberries, those tend to grow really well along disturbed edges and sort of that part shade, part sun. Um, so I think Matthew, you mentioned you have um, like a little clearing. Um, berry bushes will probably do really well there. Um, anything that fruits typically does need some amount of sun. Um, if you're working with a really shady space, um, more of those culinary herbs are going to, um, to do better. And uh, and we can think too about sort of this region's um, history, you know, sort of pre-industrial globalized food system. Um, 
and uh, and again, nature kind of provides what we need. Um, black currants, elderberry, aronia, these are um, dark nutrient rich berries that preserve really well. Um, that kind of ensures that we have year round nutrition and something that can, can keep us going during these um, long bleak winters in the North Woods. Uh, and then we have um, in uh, spring an abundance of early nutrient rich um, greens, both in the form of, of things like um, asparagus, nettle, sorrel, um, but then also um, herbs that we can use just for flavoring or, or additional um, additional nutrition in our in our dishes that um, give us that like early spring growth and detox. Um, so what's pictured here, um, I'll go kind of clockwise starting in the left corner. Um, those are filberts or hazelnuts. Um, and those, uh, if you haven't learned to recognize them yet, they're really obvious in this stage when um, those bracts are just starting to turn brown. Um, those grow wild out here. Um, the hazelnuts in our untended hedgerow have been um, thriving better than the ones that we planted in our food forest design, um, which I think says something about uh, the complexity of relationships that um, that a um, that a designed planting just simply can't mimic, um, you know, from from nature. Um, but those are one of the um, hardiest nuts that we can grow up here. There are a few others that. You know, especially in, in Polk County, uh, we're a little bit on the cusp of um, a couple of hickory varieties, for example. Um, things like black walnut are, are also really high um, nutrient dense nuts. Not going to go super into incorporating those because of their size. If you planted a black walnut now, it'll be your grandchildren who are harvesting them. Not a reason not to plant them, um, but a little bit outside of our scope. And then finally, um, some culinary herbs, you know, people know the standard ones, sage, um, creeping thyme, but uh, in this bottom right hand corner, we have marta, um, also known as wild bergamot or wild oregano, and it really does taste like oregano, it's like a um, spicy, peppery herb uh, that also has a fair number of medicinal benefits. Um, I think you'll find that a lot of culinary herbs, if you incorporate them into your garden, your, your cooking, um, there is, you know, depending on the way you prepare them, there's also a lot of medicinal benefits. Um, and again, I don't look at perennial foods as the cornerstone of my diet. Um, Instead, I kind of look to them as supplemental. Someone mentioned, you know, having a backup in case there's a seed for your annual garden. And that's absolutely what they are. Um, you know, they, they can be key preserves, special dishes, flavor. Um, so a lot of the perennials that I grow and that we grow at the farm turn into jam, sauces, seasoning blends, drinks that can all, um, easily be stored and brought out when you need some um, some like fresh nutritional um, goodness, but they are not necessarily um, the thing that's going to make up the bulk of your dinner plate. Ellie, you broke up for a minute when you were talking about the first name of the wild oregano. What, what is that called again? Oh, that's called Minarda. Minarda. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. And there is a there is a native variety and a non-native variety. Um, both have the same benefits. Um, actually, here pictured on the far left, um, that light purple, that's of the native variety, that light lavender. Um, so medicinal focused perennials, um, there are a few ways to categorize um, these options. One is um, thinking about what parts of the plant you want to harvest. Uh, berries, um, do you wanna harvest the foliage and flowers of herbs? 
you want to go for more for the bark or the roots. Um, and that can all kind of inform, be informed by your space considerations. Um, you know, if you've got a pretty small space, maybe instead of going with one or two large berry plants, you could plant a variety of herbs, um, ground cover plants. Um, if you've got a lot of space where you can kind of rotate through having multiple um, sort of multiple successions of your perennial plants, you know, harvesting the root, especially of perennial plants, um, you know, either you're, you're dividing a piece off of a larger plant or you are ending that plant's life cycle with the intention of planting, um, planting the next one to grow for a couple of years. Um, that might take a little bit, take up a little bit more space than someone with, um, you know, only one raised bed to dedicate towards perennials might be willing to, to give. Another way to categorize it is, are you thinking um, you want to have maybe a tea garden or do you want to get into making syrups or tinctures? Are you looking more for salves and topical medicinal plants? Um, that can also inform uh, what plants you choose. Um, again, though, a lot of plants have multiple uses. So something that works as a tea um, probably also has a version of a tincture that you can make. Um, and, uh, and there are lots of um, combinations that you can, that you can come up with. Um, I'm not, I wouldn't consider myself an expert herbalist. Um, so if you are like me and you're just sort of dabbling, tea is like super easy, can't really go wrong. Um, and also really fun to pick both, uh, you know, sort of the instant gratification of going out and um, picking, say, the far right picture, lemon balm, and having a fresh lemon tea. Um, but then you can also dry that and have it, um, you know, in, in deep winter. Things like tinctures and salves might take a little bit more preparation um, to, to make and have ready. And then a final lens through which you could plan a medicinal focused garden would be sort of the specific ailments that you um, know that you want to treat. So if your family has a lot of allergies um, that can uh, lean you towards certain plants versus if you've got young kids who are always getting bumps and bruises, maybe a basic first aid garden is the way to go. Um, living in the North Woods, uh, our very long dark winters, seasonal depression is a, a big concern for a lot of folks. So do you want something, um, do you want a, a garden where you can prepare teas or tinctures for um, lifting up mood and energy during our, our winters? Um, so really there, there are, um, too many possibilities to, to give like full garden plans for each of these. But if you, um, yeah, if you have questions on specific ones, please ask. And then I'll also share a couple um, books at the end that I would recommend for anyone interested in, in starting to dabble in this medicinal focused perennials. And then finally, pollinators. And again, many of the food, the native plants that are best for us in terms of food and medicine are also really important for pollinators. So um, regardless of what you plant, you're probably going to see an increase in pollinators in your space. Um, pollinators are, are often a key indicator for habitat health, um, stability, uh, monitoring pollution levels. And so seeing those in your garden, um, specifically inviting them into your garden is really gratifying and really important. Um, not just for, I think people tend to think of perennials being important for pollinators in terms of like that's their food over the summer um, or their habitat over the summer, but actually a lot of insects overwinter in the um, stems and debris of perennial plants. Um, so my little pollinator health PSA, don't clean up your gardens until it's consistently over 50 degrees outside. 
Um, I know you means you have to live with like a little bit of a messy space for longer into the spring, but there are a lot of insects um, still in their winter dormancy in um, those, uh, you know, flower stalks and leaf litter and all of that, and we don't want to disturb them. So to kind of walk you through some of the pollinators that we see here, in our berry bushes, um, we are seeing a lot of these um, giant silk moth caterpillars. So that's that first picture on the top, um, on the top and the third with the red, yellow, and blue spikes. Um, those will both turn into um, giant silk moth uh, with the, you know, big eyes on their wings. Um, so not only do we see them eating in our uh, berry bushes, they do relatively minimal damage to um, the leaves we've found. We haven't been concerned about that. We also see their cocoons um, come winter time when there's no foliage on the plants. Um, they are uh, these really big um, little woven cocoons stuck to the twigs. Um, and uh, and so we're again we're we're waiting to prune and clean up until we see that um, that those pollinators have um, hatched and woken up. We also see a lot of honeybees. Um, we keep bees at Lily Springs. We also see our native bumblebees, uh, monarchs, and a variety of other butterflies um, all over our. Um, all over our perennials. If you keep honeybees, I highly encourage you to increase your pollinator forage plantings um, because we don't want any competition for food between your honeybees and then the native pollinators in your area. Um, one of the most important things to think about if you're specifically focusing on pollinator plantings is to plant a um, a season long buffet. So you want something in bloom basically from the moment the last snow melts um, to uh, all the way until the hard frosts come in the fall. Um, a lot of annual gardens tend to, um, you know, not flower until a little bit later in the summer and then um, fruit pretty quickly and we don't get um, flowers all the way up into September and October which means that our pollinators um, that are foraging primarily from annuals tend to struggle with getting first that boost of food right when they're waking up from dormancy and then that boost of nutrition and health right before they go into the long winter. So some early pollinator perennials to plant um, are things like the bleeding hearts, um, dicentra, lots of plants in the um, Borage family, so comfrey, borage, lungwort, those all happen to also be medicinal. Um, false indigo, which is that bottom left photo, um, those are beautiful full sun prairie plant. And then we also want flowers that, that are blooming for long periods. So um, that bottom right hand picture, um, Pontilla, which is a plant in the rose family, tends to bloom for a really long period of time. This is helpful for, for pollinators um, in terms of climate resiliency. So if we have really weird out of season weather, um, say, you know, like what we've just been experiencing this past week, tons of thunderstorms um, and really, really rainy weather that's going to keep uh, pollinators um, hidden. They're not going to be out flying and foraging for food. If you have a plant, if you have plants with really short bloom windows, um, a weird weather event like that might might cause the pollinators to totally miss their opportunity to feed from those plants. Um, so those longer flowering periods help give some resiliency to that. And then finally, um, late bloomers. So we want plants that are flowering all the way up until they get covered in snow. Um, again, sedum, that's a great one. Um, uh, goldenrod. Um, goldenrod, I don't know if folks know this or not, um, but it is a personal mission of mine to, 
to end the stigma on goldenrod, it does not cause allergies because it is pollinator um, or because it is insect pollinated. Um, it's not going to cause um, seasonal allergies. It's, it's pollen isn't getting blown around in the wind. Um, and it's actually an incredibly important perennial um, pollinator plant because it blooms so late and for so long. Um, again, it also happens to be medicinal for us too. Um, there are some really beautiful cultivars of it as well. Some silver rod and white golden rod um, that can add like a really beautiful wild flowery, um, you know, full sun prairie look to your garden. So getting into the nitty gritty of some design considerations. Um, a few things to think about are, um, well, in permaculture, um, which I say with a lowercase p, we're not like a permaculture farm, um, but we do use some of those practices. Um, permaculture talks about sectors, um, sectors being any sort of energy that might be impacting your garden um, or your land. Really obvious ones are things like sun and wind, um, but you can also think about the way water moves across your property. Um, if you've got nosy neighbors and you want, um, you want a little bit more privacy um, or you live close to a noisy road and you want some, some noise buffer, um, those are all sectors that influence your space um, and sectors that influence what plants work best across your property. Um, animal pressure is another one. Uh, deer, um, rodents are potentially, um, especially things like gophers can be really damaging to our woody perennials. So th that's a, a sector to keep in mind when we're, um, when we're designing. Um, Native versus introduced. Um, what I've mentioned so far, plants I've mentioned so far have primarily been native. In some, uh, in some cases, it's appropriate to plant introduced plants, things that have naturalized. Um, you know, that's, that's stuff like asparagus. It's not actually native to North America, but it's, um, you know, it doesn't aggressively take over spaces. Um, and it has been planted and, and grown here long enough that um, there aren't any concerns about it necessarily causing any unforeseen consequences by bringing it into our, our habitats. Another design consideration um, is, you know, are you looking for something that you can harvest from every week or um, does your schedule allow for you to be like, you know, say you've got um, elderberry. Elderberry have a pretty short harvesting window. Those berries will go bad um, pretty quickly on the plant. Um, so like you've got to be ready. You've got to be working in your garden um, and keeping an eye on those berries. Um, so that's another uh, element to consider. Um, is, is how often you're able to actually get in there and, and not just tend to your plants, but then actually harvest. You don't wanna um, spend years and years cultivating this plant only to miss um, the short windows in which it's fruiting or blooming. So um, a couple things, I'll, I'll mention a couple plants um, that uh, I think are really great to include. I've mentioned a lot of the berries so far. Um, but some of these herbaceous understory plants that, that grow really well um, in and around your woody shrubs, in and around your fruit trees, if you've got them, um, these are tend to be herbs, um, flowering or otherwise. Um, many are in the mint family, um, which are great for container gardening. So if that's a limitation that you have, I highly recommend starting out with um, with things in the mint family. Um, one, because those containers are gonna help them, um, prevent them from spreading too aggressively, which is sometimes a concern with mint plants. Um, but things like Monarda, which I mentioned earlier, um, anise hyssop, lemon balm, these are all 
uh, really nutrient dense plants that we can incorporate, whether as um, culinary herbs or medicinals, the pollinators love all of them. Um, watching bumblebees try to forage from anise hyssop, which have these like long spike flowers is pretty, pretty fun. Um, so those are all great to incorporate. Um, if you're looking for more vegetable style perennials, um, sunchokes are a great option. That's also known as Jerusalem artichokes. Um, those grow kind of similar to um, potatoes. They're like a tuber uh, that you can really easily overwinter. Um, lovage. Lovage is, again, not native, but um, it's essentially the leaves taste just like celery and can be used um, as a celery replacement. Sorrel, uh, that's an early spring green and it's delicious in salads, soups, tons of savory dishes. Um, super nutrient dense, early spring detox plant. Um, and then, uh, and then, yeah, please, like, if you've got specific questions, um, specific plants you want to know about, ask uh, at the end, and I'll I'll try and think on my feet on what I'd recommend for your um, your specific garden considerations. So, some caretaking thoughts. Um, Growing perennials is a lot different than um, than annuals uh, in a few different ways. First of all, um, there's that establishment year or two um, where the caretaking is pretty similar. I mean, you want to be regularly watering, regularly weeding. Um, when they're in their establishment phase, perennials are often still pretty tender. Um, but once they hit sort of well-established year three, four, it, it depends on the specific plant um, to a certain extent. Um, those plants are going to really need like a lot less um, frequent and a lot less intense care. Um, once established, you can sort of shift into this seasonal care schedule um, where maybe once a year you're adding nutrients, whether in the form of organic nutrient sprays or compost and mulch. Um, seasonal pruning for your woody perennial plants should happen in um, late winter, usually like February. Um, for our herbaceous plants that need pruning or cut back, that can happen um, like I said, once they've died back over the winter um, and then we've reached a springtime temp, um, average temp of about 50 degrees and those overwintering insects have left, you can cut those back. Um, they also, uh, established perennials tend to need a lot less frequent watering and weeding um, because they have deeper roots because they, again, are, if they're native, they're adapted to um, sort of infrequent rains or, um, or if you plant them in wetter areas of your garden, if they can tolerate that, um, then you don't have to worry about irrigation or overhead watering as much. Similar with weeding, um, it's important in the first year or two when their roots are also getting established um, but once you've got a really healthy um, perennial guild, you can essentially um, you can essentially get away with with almost not weeding um, more than once or twice a season if you are regularly applying um, mulch, things like cardboard scraps um, or hardwood wood chips. Um, all of that will help reduce. The weed pressure, um, and then plenty of plenty of your woody shrubs are going to grow large enough that they will actually shade out any significant weed competition. Um, you can also strategically plant um, enthusiastic ground covers, like some things in the mint family, uh, to essentially suppress um, any potentially competitive weeds. Um, and and those perennial mints and stuff tend to tend to work really well with, um, you know, our understory shrubs, 
uh, so they they can kind of take care of each other. Um, long term, there are quite a few perennial plants that uh, spread elderberry. Um, lots of our, our mint family and other herbs, um, they can be divided and further propagated, uh, especially if you have limited space. This is something that you'll probably have to do relatively regularly. Um, and then uh, because tilling and broad forking is, is usually not an option with perennials, uh, unless you've got them you know, spaced on pretty wide rows and you can get in between them, um, any, any, hand, or any weeding that does happen would just be hand weeding. Um, and, uh, and again, that can be sort of once or twice a season if you've got good um, thick mulch on those plants. The last thing that differs pretty significantly from annual veg um, and annual crops is the preferred fungal to bacterial ratio in the soil. Um, so annual plants tend to prefer higher bacteria levels to fungi levels um, in the soil that they're growing in. Most perennials, especially our woody perennials, um, so a lot of our berry plants, our small shrubs, um, nut trees, those want a lot higher um, fungal communities in the um, in the soil, and we we can, you know, that makes sense in the context of their growing um, or their um, native context is maybe mixed woodlands and savannas where there's a lot of hardwood decay and therefore a lot of mycelial networks. Um, so if you are specifically focusing on, um, on woody shrubs, berries, nuts, um, I highly recommend at least once every few years um, inoculating your wood chips with beneficial mycelium. Um, a really great source for that is a company called Field and Forest Products. Um, and you can actually stack functions in there. You can inoculate your wood chips with edible mushroom uh, mycelium um, so that beneath your berries and herbs, you're also getting, um, you're getting delicious mushrooms to add to your, um, to your backyard garden. So last thing I want to leave you all with um, to think about with your perennial gardens is the relationship that you build with them. Um, if you're tending land, whether for annuals or perennials, you have a relationship with it. Um, and you're going to watch it change year after year. But I really think that there's something special in stewarding a perennial space. Um, these plants are going to grow with you. There's going to be a seasonal relationship shift during each season. It's one thing to, to kind of have this, um, you know, especially if you've got a big garden, it might feel a little bit of like panic mode when everything is fruiting and blooming and you've just got to get it all in and processed. Um, and there might not be as much time to just sort of sit with those plants as they change. Um, but I think that I think that perennial um, perennial plants really encourage, um, and their their caretaking cycles really encourage um, that seasonal check in uh, that can really shift and deepen your relationship with them. They also, like I said, often spread um, whether through cuttings, like you see on that bottom right hand picture, um, or um, you know something like marsh mallow, which you can essentially cut the root ball in half um, and it'll sprout from, it'll re-sprout or regrow from each um, section of root ball. In my mind, that's the plants asking to be gifted. They're asking to be shared with others, planted elsewhere. Um, and I think that that can be a really, you know, in the same way that we can share seeds with each other or share plant starts. Um, you know, if, if I planted way too many peppers and um, and you have more tomatoes than you thought you were going to have, we can share that. We can share our hardwood cuttings. Um, we can share our tubers and, um, and help these perennials spread um, and nourish others. I also um, truly believe that the land will get to know you and your needs. Um, 
and in a perennial space where you're not tilling every year, where you're just sort of letting the ecosystem develop um, and become more and more complex, um, pay attention to who shows up in your garden. Um, for example, um, we have never really seen mullen, uh, which is a biennial, um, in our cultivated spaces at Lily Springs before 2020. And last summer, the summer of, in so many ways, people being unable to, to take a breath, um, mullen is a, is a respiratory relief plant and it showed up in abundance um, to the point where we were just frantically trying to collect as much of it as we could and, and give it to whoever needed it um, because it really seemed like it was showing up and saying like, I'm here to offer some relief. Um, and if, if we had just been tending our cultivated spaces focused on only growing, only allowing to grow what we had originally planted, um, we wouldn't have had that opportunity to have that relationship with the mullen. So finally, um, as we should with all of our garden spaces, be them annual or perennial, um, come in gratitude, use honorable harvest practices, only take what you need and what you intend to use and share. Um, always say thank you, always ask what you can give back to the space. Um, and uh, and yeah, like like treat it like a relationship. Um, it'll, it'll ebb and flow. Um, it'll have times of abundance. It will have times of frustration. Um, and, uh, but there, I think that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of opportunity, not just for different foods or medicines or pollinator plants in a perennial garden, but also just a different relationship with the land that you're stewarding if you choose to introduce more perennials to your space. So finally, um, here are some resources. I, maybe Mike, it's possible for me to send this to you and you can send these to, um, to all of the attendees uh, so people have the links and stuff. Um, yeah, but, I can do that. Cool. I definitely recommend Xerces Society if you wanna know more specifically about regional pollinator plants. Um, they have, a ton of resources. Um, a couple local native seed companies, um, Alliance of Native Seed, Com Na native seed Keepers, um, and then Dream of Wild Health is a Minneapolis uh, organization. Um, I know they do plant sales and educational work. Um, and then Robin Wall Kimmerer, who wrote Braiding Sweetgrass and Gathering Moss, um, she teaches a lot about that relationship with plants um, and uh, kind of that entering into that, you know, agreement to care for each other. Um, Mary Sisab Genius, Plants Have So Much to Teach Us. That's a wonderful Anishinaabe um, book on a lot of, and has a lot of um, recipes and stories about our perennial plants. And then specifically for, um, for cooking, highly recommend um, the sous chef, uh, Indigenous Kitchen um, and Natives, N-A-T-I-F-S, um, great organization to tune into in terms of revitalizing Indigenous food systems, um, which will only make our, um, our diets and our relationship with food richer. Um, a couple books that I have on hand. Um, I love using plant ID books um, like the Wildflowers of Wisconsin, um, Shrubs of Wisconsin, Minnesota, um, Foraging books are a great place uh, to turn towards for both inspiration on what you can plant and then um, how to use those uh, those foods. Um, there are not I've I've struggled to find a lot of great regional like northern Midwest foraging books, um, but northeast focused books tend to cover a lot of the same plants that we have in our area. Um, 
And then finally, if you are more interested in the medicinal preparations, um, Rosemary Gladstar is a great resource um, and she has a ton of books and resources on um, medicinal preparation. Like I said, I'm not an herbalist. I find her work really approachable um, and a great place to start if you're learning how to incorporate um, both garden plants and foraged plants into um, your food and, and sort of backyard medicine cabinet. So that's all I have. I would love to answer questions. Um, if you want me to go back to specific slides that you have questions about, I can definitely pull those back up. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll open it up to whatever folks want um, input on or want to discuss. So yeah, I guess if you if you want to try unmuting yourself, you could do that. Otherwise, type your question in and, and I can convey them to Ellie or she might see them too. Hey, Ellie, so back to uh, when you're trying to build the fungal network in the soil and you talked about <laughs> inoculating some type of fungus in there. Mm -hmm. How do you find that to be more effective than doing like a heavy wood chip mulch? Or do you like inoculate it at first so then the shrubs start dropping the wood chip mulch? Or... So there are a few different ways you can do it. Um, we typically, because we are making most of our own mulch, we have enough hardwood trees and, and deadfall that we can sort of chip our own mulch. Um, when we do that, we mix in uh, mycelium and then we let it age for a year. Um, that is, yeah, one thing to note. If you're buying mulch, it should already be aged. Um, but if you are making your own, um, you're gonna want to make sure to let it sit for about a year. Hardwood mulch will um, actually use nitrogen, bind up nitrogen um, in its initial decomposition process, uh, which makes it unavailable for plants. And nitrogen is a key um, for the green growth. Um, so, uh, but then you could, all, you could also inoculate in place. So if you've already got some mulch established, you could just sprinkle that mycelium. It, it comes in a diff couple different substrates. Um, you can get sawdust fawn, which is really easy to, um, to sprinkle on your garden. Um, and then you can just continue to add mulch on top of that. Um, you can get really nerdy about it and uh, basically cultivate your own mycelium from, um, yeah, get really, really local and like go into your woods, find some mycelium growing on a decaying log. Um, and there are some ways that you can uh, sort of cultivate your own mycelium to inoculate your garden with. Um, yeah. And uh, and I can type a, a book recommendation in the chat for that. Awesome. Thanks for addressing the question. Yeah. Um, someone asked in the chat, do I need to build up and restore soil private prior to planting perennials? Um, not necessarily. Um, I'd certainly recommend like an initial layer of compost um, and then turn, you know, before you have anything planted in the space, turn some compost into your soil, um, especially if you're working with something that's low fertility, low organic matter. If you get that compost a little bit deeper into the soil, so it's not just sitting on top, that's gonna remind your plant to send its roots down deeper. Um, so that they don't just hang out on the surface. Um, but, you know, perennials are a long game. You're, you're going to have to spend a few years building soil up. There's a, you know, different ways you can do that. If, if you've got um, chickens or backyard animals, you can age manure and add that in. Um, leaf litter added to your beds in the fall um, can decom decompose over the winter and, and that can add, um, add soil um, fertility and, and organic matter. And then um, if you really want to um, check all the boxes, you can, uh, you can do a soil test prior to planting, figure out if there are any specific amendments that you might want to 
to add. Um, otherwise, I just sort of recommend, um, you know, what do we have in our forests? We have decaying hardwood, um, we have decaying leaf litter and foliage, and then a certain amount of animal manure and, and some combination of those can usually bring your soil into pretty good health. Another question about wild plums. Yes, plums do grow well in this area. Um, I don't know of anything, I mean, I don't know local varieties off the top of my head. Um, we grow a few cultivars at the farm, um, Black Ice, Mount Royal, and Toka are three um, high producing plums. They are really cold hardy um, and they have a staggered fruiting window, um, which means they have a staggered flowering window. Um, another thing about the benefit of sort of the long flowering windows, if you're growing something for fruit for yourself, um, you know, in the same way that a big rainstorm will keep the bees inside, it also might knock your flowers off the plant entirely. Um, so in years past, if we've had rough spring weather, we've sometimes lost, um, you know, one variety of plums crops, because uh, those flowers were open and vulnerable. And then, um, and then other ones that hadn't yet flowered were okay. Um, those varieties were uh, Mount Royal, Black Ice, and Toka. Other questions folks have? Got a question about clay soil. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, clay soil is tricky. I'd say um, you might have to do a little bit more work on um, aeration and um, getting good water drainage. So uh, Lily Springs has a ton of sandy soil. So we actually struggle to, um, to keep our plants hydrated with clay soil. Um, you would want to think about, um, I'd maybe start with some like surface growing plants, like get some good ground cover. Um, you could think about um, sort of phasing your perennial garden while you build up more um, organic material in your soil, um, while you build up a little bit looser soil. Um, you know, maybe don't don't go straight for um, straight for your full garden design. Um, I don't work so much with clay soil, so I don't have a ton of specific recommendations or troubleshooting, but if others have grown in, in clay heavy soils, please feel free to jump in. I got a question about the which berries make the best jam. So um, I highly recommend um, black currants, um, black currants. So we have red currants and like white pink currants um, locally. And uh, those are fine. Um, I always go for the darkest berries possible because those, um, there's a direct correlation between how dark the fruit or um, foliage is and how nutrient dense it is. So black currants are awesome. Um, and then Aronia, if you are willing to like put a little bit more sugar or honey in there, is delicious. Um, and Aronia have like the highest content. Um, oh, I'm not going to be able to remember the um, the specific word. Anthocyanins, which is a compound that helps um, mitigate free radicals. Um, so they're you know, there's something like 
10 times higher than blueberries on sort of the superfood chart. Um, and then uh, besides aronia and blackcurrant, um, elderberry, different varieties of elderberry make better jams than others. If you want to incorporate elderberry um, for jam, I would recommend the John's variety. That's a good sort of homesteader level. And then, okay, I've got a question on what plants do well in riparian environments and privacy from neighbors. Um, I'm going to hit hard on the elderberries. Elderberries do great with wet feet. They don't mind them at all. Um, and then they also, specific varieties like John's, um, John's variety grows 10 to 12 feet tall um, and can grow a few feet a year. Um, so that's a quick, easy one um, that within a year or two, you'll have sort of a hedgerow or a, a fence. Um, and then in addition to, to elderberries in terms of riparian or wetland environments, um, see um, plenty of herbs um, can can do with um, you know pretty wet soils um, and then aronia do pretty well with um, with wet soil um, you certainly wouldn't want uh, you know elderberry are the only ones that I've seen that have done pretty well in standing you know temporary standing water seasonal standing water um, that can become a concern for woody perennials for um, for you know rot in the um, in the bark, and then other yeah other recommendations for privacy from neighbors certainly trees although um, fruit trees can be somewhat slow growing if you're really looking for um, quick privacy um, a non well. Things in the poplar family are, are quick growing. They can usually grow a foot or two a year. Um, those are also nice if you're dealing with um, pollution. They're pretty resilient to, um, you know, if you've got neighbors who spray pestic pesticides, um, those, can, uh, those can help um, prevent um, or catch pesticide drift and they usually do pretty well. Vines, certainly, um, hardy kiwi, is a great vine um, to plant up here if you've got a fence already in place or trellises. Um, and then uh, other than that, I mean, yeah, grapevines, um, anything that you can, um, that you can trellis, uh, that can, can certainly help with privacy, you know, for noise, pollution, and then just nosy neighbors. And just in the in the break here a minute, I just I've typed in a couple of classes where we have coming up, y'all. And I'll try to remember to send links to those when I send out uh, the video recording of this class. We're recording this, so I'll send you a link and you can watch it on our YouTube channel if you want to again. And I'll try to remember to send these links, but we've got Elle teach Ellie's gonna teach cooking with native berries uh, on the other side of the summer, September 11. And then just in about a month now, May 11, we've got Herbal Allies in These Times, taught by Nancy Graydon, who is at Red Clover Herbal Apothecary, just five miles from Amory. Um, so anyway, check our website too for upcoming classes, but those are two you might in particular be interested in. But yeah, keep, keep the questions coming, or Ellie, if you have something else you wanna share, go ahead. Um, I put in the in the chat. Um, uh, oh, it looks like I messaged privately, but the chat um, in the chat is organic mushroom cultivation and micro remediation. Um, that's by Travis Cutter, I believe. Um, that's a great uh, book for incorporating um, fungi into your um, into your gardens. I wanted to talk more about mushrooms, but like. 
their weird little alien creatures that don't really fit into perennials. Um, but certainly they do well in perennial spaces and I highly recommend um, including those both for the health of your plants and because um, they're fun and delicious for humans too. Ellie, what about uh, Lily Springs Farm tours or classes? People go to your website to, you know, find out about what offerings you have coming up too? Yeah, yeah, I'll do a little um, shameless self-promotion. So we are selling elderberry cuttings right now. Um, we have all four varieties that we grow, uh, John's, Bob Gordon, Ranch, and Wildwood. All of those are um, really well adapted to, um, to our cold climate. I'll put our um, farm store in the chat for you. Um, and then, yeah, we, we have um, a few classes lined up for the summer. Um, we have actually quite a bit of elderberry education happening this year. So we have a field day um, through the Savannah Institute, which is, um, I'm remiss for not mentioning them previously. The Savannah Institute is an excellent perennial agroforestry resource. They are more geared towards broad acre farmers, um, but certainly still a good resource to check out. Um, they're doing a lot to promote regenerative perennial agriculture in the Midwest. Um, and we'll be hosting a full day of elderberry, um, elderberry education the last weekend of August, I believe. Um, we'll have more information out about that soon. Um, and then in terms of, I don't think we have any upcoming like tours of the property um, coming up, but certainly contact me if you're interested. Um, I'll put my email in the chat. Um, and then we also have on, um, through, it's called Airbnb experiences, but it's essentially you can book activities. You don't have to book an Airbnb stay, um, but we have a few different classes um, up on Airbnb experiences. One about um, using goats to graze out invasives in our forest, um, as well as sort of a plant ID hike. Um, feel free to get in touch if you specifically want like a perennial ag farm tour version of that. Um, and we can set something up. After, after a full year of COVID and like mostly canceled classes or Zoom classes, I am so excited to host people on the farm this summer. Um, we've really, really missed having in-person events. Um, this is wonderful too. <laughs> no, um, yeah, not knocking uh, the, the farm table virtual class classes because this has been a wonderful opportunity, but um, we'll definitely have in-person events happening this summer. Yes. <laughs> Amen to that. The red-rooted pigweed. Um, honestly, uh, I would, if you have, if you have the ability, I would do um, you know, broad fork the space or heavily mow it um, pretty frequently a few times to just like get that plant a little bit suppressed. Um, you can also, depending on your uh, property specifics, you can think about a controlled burn. Um, that's something that I didn't really touch on, but um, fire Intermediate periodic fire is um, really important in per most perennial ecosystems, um, especially our sort of open savannas and prairies of the Midwest and the Great Plains. Um, and a lot of, um, you know, invasive or aggressive weeds can be um, brought into check with some strategic um, low level burns. Um, I don't have a ton of resources personally on that, except that, um, you know, a good place to check for advice on that would be um, like Native Prairie uh, Alliances. Um, they often do sort of volunteer run uh, prairie, prairie burns. Um, and then there's lots of resources on YouTube and stuff on sort of backyard burns. 
Um, but yeah, the pigweed is tenacious. Um, <laughs> you know, carve out the spaces, um, sort of, uh, you know, bit by bit that you reclaim from it. Um, but yeah, we, we struggle with the pigweed too. Pigweed, lamb's quarter is some things like lamb's quarter you can eat has, um, it's more nutritious than spinach. Um, but yeah, some of the weeds just don't do much good to us humans and they can get pretty frustrating. Um, Ellie, just want to say thank you to you and all the preparation you put into to your PowerPoint and getting ready for us. So thank you for that. During that chat, I actually had some uh, other bearing black crayons show up in the in the mail. So I thought that was some interesting oh, time. Oh. <laughs> nice. Good thing. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see if I can get them in the ground tonight. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Good luck with, with um, your growing seasons, everyone. So thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. And do enjoy, yeah, being outside and getting your hands dirty. As I think we all know, it, it it's good for the soul. So thanks, everybody. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie, very Thanks, much. Everyone. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you. Bye. Good night. <laughs>